I'd really like to preach three weeks in a row. It, somehow you get to see the bigger picture. You're more able to draw the lines from two weeks ago to today. And you also get to appreciate the well thought through composition that is the Gospel of Mark. This week's Gospel reading, however, doesn't really seem to be that exciting in comparison to last week's death of John the Baptist. There is no intrigue leader here that in the end decides against repentance and turning his life around. But he clings to power and status and reputation. So nothing of that. This week, Jesus welcomes his disciples back that he sent out on a mission two Sundays ago. And they tell him about their experiences, what they did and what they taught. And Jesus sees that they are in need of rest. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Does that sound familiar to your work day? How many meetings do you have? People coming and going in person or on Zoom, and you hardly find the time to eat because you want to finish something and you deem a break not to be important. Because someone, again, has scheduled a meeting over your lunch break. Because the food in your fridge is not that tempting. So Jesus suggests a retreat back in the wilderness, where he went immediately after his baptism and following his call. The wilderness is a challenging place with its wild beasts. But it's also a place where you learn to focus, to breathe, to pray, and where you can escape from civilization and whatever it is that civilization asks from you. Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. Now, doesn't that sound tempting? For me, it does. But as they arrive at their destination, they are already welcomed by a great crowd. The people have seen Jesus and the disciples leaving and guessed their destination. And like wildfire, the news spread in all the towns and villages where they are headed. And so the town folks hurry on foot and await Jesus and the disciples. There are people everywhere. A retreat gone wrong. But instead of turning the boat around and trying a different shore, instead of going deeper into the wilderness, Instead of sending the people away, Jesus and his disciples stay. He comes ashore, sees the great crowd, and feels not annoyance, not anger, anger, not frustration. No, he feels compassion. These people are like sheep without a shepherd. Now, when you approach a regular crowd of people, the sheep without shepherd image is probably not what comes to your mind first. So these people out there at the shore, in the wilderness, must have emanated despair and helplessness as they stared at Jesus arriving. What are their hopes and their expectations as they run ahead to be able to meet Jesus and to interact with him? A flock of sheep. A flock of sheep without shepherd out in the wilderness looking for a leader, for guidance, for a change, for someone who sees them, someone whose presence among them they can feel with every cell of their body. He's not just there, coincidentally. He is with them. A shepherd, someone who really cares for them, who goes and searches for them, who heals them, who takes care of their land and their weak, who guides them to fruitful pastures. The sheep, the people on the shore, they see or rather feel that potential in Jesus. And there's the stark contrast between Jesus and Herod and the other leaders of Galilee that attended Herod's birthday party. The contrast couldn't be more intense there is the leader who kills a man as gratification for an entertaining dance. And here is, here is the man who stands among the commoners, present, listening, caring. And even if the people on the shore don't know yet, we know 
that this shepherd gets killed by that kind of leaders who claim to protect others, but in the end only care for themselves. This shepherd gets killed and dying asks for forgiveness for his torturers. A rather different kind of shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And whatever it is that the people on the shore see in Jesus, maybe it is that image of Psalm 23. Mark sums up Jesus' feelings toward the people in one word, compassion. Now that word has an interesting background. In Hebrew, compassion is a plural noun, rachamim. It's singular, rachem, means womb. In Greek, the language Mark composed this gospel, the word is splanchnon, which can be translated as intestines, gut, or womb. And you know what? I personally like this connection with womb very much because every human originates from a womb. And honestly, that thought sometimes helps me when I find it hard to be compassionate because then I pause and I try to see that human coming from a womb, that baby, that child this person once was, helpless and dependent on others, being just there to receive food, love, care. So we can say that seeing the crowd, Jesus feels an emotion in his intestines, a bodily reaction. He sees God's own children and he feels for them. And the text says he begins to teach them many things. Now the next few verses are left out of today's reading, but the story continues. After he teaches, he feeds them. 5,000 men plus women and children. Out of almost nothing, more than enough is provided for everyone. And after that, and after he spent a night on the lake, he continues to heal all who approach him. I wonder what our world would look like if we focused on being compassionate, if we just stopped doing the things that we needed to do, ignoring our own tiredness, we would just be present, care for those who need support, and at the same time be cared for. We would listen to those who need an ear and at the same time be listened to by others. We would grieve with others over there and our own, own broken relationship, missed chances, lost jobs, and dead loved ones. To listen and to hear about traumatic experiences, pain inflicted without knowing, that would widen our perception and help us to choose our words more carefully. We would be more patient with those struggling with a loss or depression because we would feel the reality of their grief or anxiety even as the years pass on. And we would let them know we're here, still, always. Church would probably not be really comfortable, but there would be room for all and room for healing. We would be able to heal together from whatever it is that we're hurting, our feeling broken, incomplete, or not enough. I know this is a utopia because it must be exhausting in addition to what is going on in our world. So we carefully try to dose what we can or want to be compassionate about, like carefully selected prayer petitions, why we could pray for the whole world all the time. I know we must draw the line somewhere to make the need in the world bearable for us. Isn't that what you call mental hygiene? Or maybe we do have to go into the wilderness too to find compassion because civilization 
is not so civilized after all. But something we can do and something we should do is seize the chance anew over and over again every day to remember that we are Christians, that our shepherd is a shepherd that prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemy. And that shepherd welcomes everyone at the table. It is a table where we remember Jesus' compassion for those waiting at the shore, as well as his compassion for those who hung him on the cross. A table where we receive love and forgiveness, passive, without condition, just as we are. A table where we are strengthened to go into the world and to do our best being a shepherd to others. While at the same time we know the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.